So this lecture is part of the ASU Lagman Navigating Change in Museums lecture series that aim at exploring the issues of diversity museum practices and discuss key issues regarding the future and the role of the museum. Um, and also key issues regarding the role of the museum in the future in a changing society regarding race, community, decolonization, cultural diversity, categories of display, cultural activism, etc. This series is part of the ASU LACMA Fellowship Program, and today Jane Manuel is going to be is one of the fellow, the ASU LACMA Fellow, that is going to be moderating the session. This is a partnership that started in 2018 between ASU and LACMA and grew to include the Heard Museum, the ASU Art Museum, the Phoenix Art Museum, the Paris Art Museum, and recently the Van Misbrook Art Museum. Um, and this is great because we want to create a kind of a network, national network of um, fellows uh, to increase diversity and leadership in our museum in the United States. The program supports a cultural diverse generation of museum professional to become and to promote inclusivity both in museums and in art history. Um, so we are delighted to present the in-person lecture narrating this procession subverting colonial legacies within and beyond the museum by Shimri Lee. We are particularly delighted because it is the first lecture that we are having uh, since the pandemic. So this is wonderful. The moderator of the lecture will be Jane Manuel, who will introduce extremely, extremely Lee. And she is administrator for the collections management program at LACMA through an interdisciplinary art history, ethnic studies, transnational feminist approach. Manuel seeks to uplift Filipina, Filipinex artists and stories of the diaspora into the institutional canal. So the fellows do a fellowship, um, an MA in art history, and usually you know, they, they bring in um, different issues that they want to explore. Lee will give a lecture after Manuel's introduction, after which there will be time for question and answers. Manuel will chair, moderate the questions that are going to be in the room, and I will be uh, reading questions from uh, online, um, audience and then so please um, send your question through the chat and then thank you again all for being here so jane thank you It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shimri Lee. She is a writer, educator, and curator based in Philadelphia. She's the author of Decolonized Museums. Her work has appeared in Warscapes, Africa is a Country, Jadalia, Trans-Asia Photography, and Jerusalem Quarterly. And an interdisciplinary scholar working at the intersection of visual culture, performance, and critical security studies, Shimri's research, research interests relate to how violence is perpetuated, packaged and sold in contemporary culture, and the role of visual art and performance in decolonizing and building community. She holds a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies from NYU and an MA in International Human Rights Law from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. She currently teaches community-based adult education at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lee. Audio works okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you for that introduction. Jane, thank you to Cecilia for inviting me here and making <clears throat> all of this possible. It's really an honor. Um, so my talk today is loosely based on my recent book, Decolonized Museums, and it will be divided into a few sections. So first, I will give a brief introduction to the colonial foundations of Western museums and ask what it means to decolonize these spaces. My central question being, can you decolonize something whose very foundation is built on colonization? Um, and then I will grapple with that question through a number of artistic and curatorial initiatives that have attempted to transform 
the museum into a space for productive decolonial intervention to varying degrees of success. And throughout, I want to reflect on the concept of repair and what it takes to repair historical and ongoing harms, as well as asymmetrical systems of power um, and the role of museums in such processes. Um, so the idea of repair is especially hard to fathom when we reflect on the deeply entrenched nature of colonialism, this multi-tentacled entity um, or system that encompasses the you know, historical policy concerning the domination and theft of other territories um, and their resources, um, racial and racist ideologies used to prop up or legitimize such domination and extraction, um, including the suppression of identity, language, and traditions of indigenous people, um, as well as narratives that hold up uh, Western systems of knowledge as the norm. Um, and of course, the structure is not confined to the past, but overflows into the present. So here in the US, settler colonialism is an ongoing project in, uh, in which settlers continue to occupy land, exploit resources, um, dictate social, economic, political systems. Um, and this project is usually surrounded in historical amnesia. It's not usually acknowledged. Um, so as anthropologist Elizabeth Edwards writes, the colonial is a presence that is all saturating, overpowering, ever present, persistent, and fundamental to the experience of contemporary life. Um, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, museums emerged as an active tool of colonialism, um, showcasing Eurocentric and racialized ideals and narratives, and offering a public justification for expansion and imperial rule. Um, and when I refer to museums throughout this talk, I am intentionally blurring the line between art and natural history museums. Um, art museums being an outgrowth of the same kind of taxonomical systems first used by natural history museums. Um, and both falling within the definition of Western institutions offered by curator Stephen Miller, who writes that museums are Western inventions that grew out of the enlightenment and the age of exploration in which scholars, explorers, politicians, and cultural entrepreneurs found objects to be of immense personal and didactic value. Um, and these objects and the processes of their collection and preservation were entirely bound up in the colonial. Um, we see this in one of the predecessors to modern museums, um, cabinets of curiosity. Um, so in the 18th century, you saw the rise in popularity of cabinets of curiosities, private collections assembled by rich merchants and world travelers um, made up of objects from the natural world, such as preserved animal and plant specimens and minerals, um, as well as artworks and cultural artifacts. Um, a lot of the times these were objects that were considered to be rare and exotic, um, meant to reflect upon the worldly status of the person collecting them. Um, and they also give us a window into what um, James Clifford describes as the restless power and desire of the modern West to collect the world, which was a driving force at the time um, and brought together the twin projects of private collecting and European colonialism. In fact, the desire for these rare collectibles was a motivating factor for the launching and funding of colonial enterprises. Um, and this desire to collect sustained colonialist notions of white discovery and ownership. Um, in the 19th century, many of these objects and these kinds of collections were reclassified and cataloged and became the foundation for the modern museum as we know it. Um, for example, this is a picture of the British Museum's Enlightenment Gallery, um, an encyclopedic collection of the natural world that started out as the personal cabinet of curiosity of Sir Hans Sloan, um, an 18th century British physician and naturalist who amassed a, a massive collection of objects from around the world. Um, how did he do this? Uh, his collecting was funded in large part by his marriage to an heiress of a plantation in Jamaica. So his wealth was directly tied to the Atlantic slave trade um, and the reach of the British global empire. Um, and later on his encyclopedic collection 
became the basis of the British Museum. Um, and so here he is, a, a bust um, at the British Museum um, in 2020 in response to the Black Lives Matter uprisings across the globe and the accompanying um, reckoning with racial injustice. Um, that bust of Han Sloan was moved um, from its plinth in the museum um, to a glass display case that added some context um, for Sloan and his collection. And we can kind of talk about that a little bit later, um, these sorts of initiatives which add context. Um, so, you know, even as this Enlightenment gallery represented itself to the public as um, scientific, instructional, didactic, behind these professional protocols of storage, exhibition, handling, there was this story of theft, um, and there often is. Um, we see these protocols at work in the looting of the Benin bronzes, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, these are thousands of royal and sacred objects that were violently looted from present day Nigeria um, by British troops in 1897. Um, and they're not just bronzes, they include um, engraved ivory tusks, iron masks, wooden heads, and hundreds of brass plaques that were once um, nailed to the walls of Benin's royal palace, mainly from the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and there are at least 3,000 of these items scattered worldwide, maybe more, no one's entirely sure. Um, and so here on the left is an image of British soldiers with objects looted from the royal palace um, during the military expedition to Benin City in 1897. And on the right here, um, we have a sort of decontextualization that takes place once these um, items are placed in a museum. So this image, um, which circulated at the time um, as a postcard of the expedition, depicts triumphant British soldiers kneeling next to piles of ivory and artwork looted from the palace of the Oba, the ruler of the kingdom of Benin. Um, and postcards like this staged the colonial space as one that was ripe for plunder. Um, such theft was justified as a right of conquest under the terms of the 1884 Berlin Conference um, in which European leaders established the rules for the conquest and partition of Africa. Um, it also justified this theft as part of a rescue operation in which the people of Benin were, were framed as being unable to protect their own assets or recognize the value in them. Um, and, you know, it reflects this fever of knowledge accumulation <clears throat> that was tied with the imperial drive to collect the entire world. Um, here are more images that were taken from this expedition. As you can see here, the word loot was written at the top of the page, um, which is very interesting. Um, they just kind of said it how it is. <laughs> um, and this is uh, yeah, more loot. Um, here is an archivist's note that was written um, when one of these looted tusks was officially absorbed into the British Museum's collection in 1897. And so this note represents the moment in which this object became classified, absorbed into the protocols and regulations surrounding um, professional museum practices um, of museum collection, handling, display, purchasing, and so on. Um, and we see the same tusk listed in the British Museum's online collections repositioned as art and placed into a canon of art history. And so once in the Western Museum, these objects are framed by white walls, um, you know, specific lighting, wall texts that tell a neutral authoritative narrative of the objects on display, relegating imperial violence to the background, almost like an open secret. And I think filmmaker and theorist um, Ariella Azulay um, really explains this well. She describes this sort of transformation as constitutive of the various scholarly, curatorial, and professional procedures which have transformed world destroying violence into a decent and acceptable occupation. So there's therefore this failure to reckon with the extractive nature of colonialism 
um, by which Nigeria, in the case of the Benin bronzes, and most of the global south was robbed of culture, resources, and people in plain sight. Um, and how this exploitation of living beings and resources um, were cemented into the very foundation of the museum, um, as well as systems of cataloging and categorizing. Okay, so what would this sort of reckoning look like? Um, which brings me to decolonization. Um, oftentimes this word is kind of casually thrown around online in the media and academic discourse um, in social justice spaces without um, nuance or maybe as like a stand in for the concept of diversity, which it is not the same thing. Um, as indigenous scholar Autumn Blackdeer reminds us, decolonization is not a synonym for diversity, equity or inclusion. There is no decolonial checklist or afternoon training that will magically decolonize your syllabus, classroom, or organization as a whole. Um, so here's what it is not. So what is it? Um, on a basic level, a decolonization is a historic um, process that former colonies underwent to free themselves from colonial supremacy and gain their independence. Um, today, the term is used to talk about a more expansive restorative justice um, through cultural, psychological, economic freedom, um, which involves challenging any behavior or belief system that consciously or subconsciously perpetuates white supremacy um, by centralizing whiteness as the norm um, or upholding Eurocentric knowledge. Um, as Nelson um, Mal Maldonado Torres explains, Decoloniality is the production of counter discourses, counter knowledges, counter creative acts, and counter practices that seek to dismantle coloniality and to open up multiple other forms of being in the world. Um, and this countering is continuous work. Um, the question is can it even be done in institutions like museums whose history is entirely based around colonial extraction? Um, some say no. Um, that the museum should just be abolished altogether. Um, and others say that decolonization is possible and needs to involve a number of interrelated strategies. Um, so according to Giblin, Ramos and Grout, decolonizing the museum concerns the proactive identification, interrogation, deconstruction and replacement of hierarchies of power that replicate colonial structures. And there's no easy blueprint for museums looking to do this. Um, it's more of a, you know, I really like this word proactive. It's a proactive um, methodology, which involves a constant questioning of how the institution relates to its own history, um, as well as ongoing forms of colonial erasure. Um, with this questioning being geared towards the empowerment of previously excluded voices. Um, and it, you know, it needs to translate into something active and all encompassing, touching on all aspects of museum work. So from acquisitions to audience engagement, to labeling, to uh, conservation and so forth. Um, but of course it's impossible to overhaul the entire system without first recognizing and grappling with the museum's foundation in colonialism, um, and a canon of knowledge steeped in Eurocentrism. Um, so for the remainder of this talk, I just want to spotlight a few um, artistic and curatorial initiatives that have attempted to um, challenge this system of reality and critically engage with colonial histories through a variety of means. Um, okay. And of course, you know, repatriation, giving back objects and stolen artifacts from their communities of origins needs to be central here. Um, it's not going to be the main scope of my talk today, but as you'll see, um, many of these interventions um, are in conversation with processes like repatriation. So first, um, there are those initiatives that are uh, not necessarily trying to take down the whole institution, but rather make visible the colonial forces that shape it. Um, Mark Dion, for example, is a New York-based artist who 
interrogates the genesis of the institution itself, um, specifically the kind of collecting done by people like Sirhan Sloan, who I mentioned earlier. Um, Dion is also a collector. He travels through flea markets, uh, antique shows, natural spaces like beaches and forests, all in search of what he just calls stuff, natural and <laughs> um, commercial stuff. And then he plays around with this stuff um, in the context of the museum um, as a means of reflecting on systems of classification, display, um, exploration, and preservation that inform the construction of knowledge, um, specifically when it comes to the natural world. That's his main focus. Um, in this piece uh, on the far side there, titled The Classical Mind, he arranges items along a physical hierarchy, um, mirroring an enlightenment idea known as the great chain of being, which um, placed humans at the top of the kingdom of life. You can see it also visualized um, in this print um, in the center here. And so this visual metaphor um, has been proven to be quite toxic. First of all, it, it separates humans from other living forms of life. Um, it's also served as justification for other types of rankings um, popularized in natural history museums. Like if you look at the history of the American Natural History Museum in New York or the Pitt Rivers Museum um, in Oxford, um, both of these institutions arrange objects along a, a so-called evolutionary timeline, which ranked humans in order of intelligence um, with non-Europeans occupying a lower rank. Um, so Dion, takes these ideas and pours them into this staircase as a structural form, um, which is make to, made to um, make these hierarchies seem uncanny and strange. And he writes about how in order to understand the museum, he has had to become the museum, taking on these duties of collecting and archiving and displaying. Um, he writes by critical analyzing the master narratives and techniques of display employed by the institutions, I can discern the ideology embedded in them. Being critical may also be just another way to love these museums. That contradiction is what I try to explore through my production of artwork. So here's he's, he's talking about loving the museum um, through exploring these contradictions. Um, Fred Wilson is another artist who maybe pushes this sort of contradiction into a more uncomfortable place. Um, in 1992, um, the Maryland Historical Society invited Wilson to sift through their collections and rearrange the space from his own point of view as a black artist. And so he was given access to the museum collection and artistic leeway to reinstall it from his own point of view. Um, so for example, as you can see in this image, he placed ornate silver jugs um, in a display case next to iron slave shackles as a way to link this grand display of wealth, which is ever present in historical museums, to its production um, through enslavement and subject subjugation. As he explained, quote, I place them together because normally you have one museum for beautiful things and one museum for horrific things. Actually, they had a lot to do with one another. The production of one was made possible by the subjection and forced by the other. And so here he's kind of refusing the type of classification and separation that takes place in the museum um, that kind of puts this subjugation and history of theft to the side, um, kind of masking it or not acknowledging it. Um, he's also kind of playing with irony in how he uses glass cabinets, um, neat labels, selective lighting, and so on to mimic the methods of museum display. Um, he really wanted audiences to think about how they move through these spaces where knowledge is constructed and made to seem natural or neutral. Finally, in this category um, of reflection um, is the Australian Aboriginal artist, Christian Thompson, who plays with the history of the museum in a more literal sense um, and really inserts himself into the history of the museum 
as someone who is directly impacted um, by its colonial legacies. So in 2012, while he was at the University of Oxford um, as the first indigenous Australian to be admitted to the university, he presented the Museum of Others in which he photographed himself holding print portraits of famous eth ethnographers and explorers with their eyes cut out um, so that the viewers faced with Christian's own eyes staring back at them through these masks. Um, and so these figures include the British imperialist James Cook, who infamously paved the way for the violent colonization of Australia. Um, he also did this with anthropologist and social Darwinist um, Walter Spencer and the archaeologist um, Augustus Pitt Rivers, the founder of the museum, um, who collected thousands of artifacts taken as a result of British imperial expansion and occupation, including human remains from Australian Aboriginal communities um, and arranged them in this developmental order. Um, and so talking about this work, Thompson poses this question, um, why am I burdened with the responsibility of having to deal with a history that was thrust upon me? I thought I'm going to step directly into the museum and invert that responsibility and reflect it back to the audience. So again, there's this uncanniness here in which Thompson injects himself into a supposedly you know, neat finished colonial past and unsettles it. Um, and yet, you know, this truth telling initiative is limited because the Pitt Rivers Museum continues to house objects sought by indigenous communities all over the world. And so with, with all of these initiatives that I'm spotlighting, you know, it's important to kind of take them with a grain of salt and ask, you know, is the museum bringing in these artists to kind of give itself a critical coat of progressive paint? Um, because it's much harder to actually take practical steps towards restitution. Okay, so we see these sorts of limitations at play, I think even more so in curatorial initiatives that attempt to rewrite colonial era narratives surrounding artifacts and displays, um, or else add additional context to these displays, sort of like a, a palimpsest of narratives layered on top of one another, like we saw with the Hans Sloan um, being moved into the glass display case. Um, so for example, for years, if you were to walk into the American Museum of Natural History in New York, um, you'd be greeted by this diorama depicting an imagined 17th century meeting between Dutch settlers and the Lenape people, the original inhabitants of what is now New York. Um, of course, the scene is harmful for a number of reasons. Um, for one, it backs up the myth that Native Americans are vanishing or extinct, kind of freezes them behind these glass walls. Um, it props up a lie that colonization was an equal exchange between equal parties um, rather than violently enforced uh, hierarchy. Um, and it omits the genocide, land theft, and slavery upon which this country was built. Um, and after much pressure from activist group, groups like Decolonize This Place, the museum decided to add captions to the glass, um, which asked visitors to reconsider this scene and explained how the display ignores how complex and violent colonization was for native people. Here's a little zoomed in version. And so the activists welcomed this initiative, but they still felt what they described as the oppressive weight of institutional inertia in the room. Um, this is from a public letter that they wrote um, with the responses too measured and painfully slow in coming. Um, at the current rate of progress, it will take another 50 years to redo all of the cultural halls. So they're referencing, you know, of course, other harmful representations throughout the museum. Um, as well as uh, the institution's collection of human remains and sacred objects. Um, recently, ProPublica um, came out with a really interesting initiative in which they document the number of um, human remains or stolen artifacts in museums across the US. 
And the American Museum of Natural History still holds the human remains of nearly 2000 Native Americans. So even with these additional perspectives um, that support decolonial narratives and shine a light on harmful museum displays, questions remain, um, namely, is it even possible to achieve structural change through incremental edits um, to exhibitions or must the entire institution be rebuilt within a decolonial framework? Um, and can the museum transcend colonial era dynamics? Um, or is it going to try to continuously um, adapt itself um, with pressure from activists kind of driving any sort of change that happens? And also the question is like, you know, who is doing this sort of interpretive work and under what conditions? Um, so in 2017, the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in the UK um, invited six women of color, um, all with various post-colonial heritages to co-curate an exhibition um, that would use the museum's collection to confront its colonial history. Um, sort of like how Fred Wilson was also invited into the museum space. Um, so this show um, titled The Past Is Now, um, not only explored Birmingham's relation to imperial violence, but also interrogated the museum's claims of neutrality. So for example, in a section on Kenya's independence, homemade guns used in the Mau Mau rebellion against the British, um, which the museum later acquired, um, are relabeled with the question, can objects collected under colonial rule be used to tell a fair story? And later, um, Sumaya Qasim, one of the curators of the exhibit, wrote about how she really lamented the emotional labor that was involved with this project, including inadequate pay, tokenization, censorship. Um, she felt that her fellow curators had been kind of brought in to provide decolonial thoughts, um, which were like used temporarily and then discarded. Um, so decolonization cannot simply mean hiring more diverse um, staff or listening to the concerns of visitors from marginalized communities. Um, sometimes these efforts at inclusion are used to manage or avoid a more radical overhaul that's actually needed. Um, as Qasem writes, I do not want to see decolonization become part of Britain's national narrative as a pretty curio with no substance, or worse, for decoloniality to be claimed as yet another great British accomplishment. The railways, two world wars, one world cup, and decolonization. <laughs> okay. So I have one more short section. Um, so yeah, all that to say decolonization is not a simple checklist. It's not simply enough to layer an additional meaning um, onto a museum narrative without asking more difficult questions concerning the material reality of the institution, like who directs the budget, um, whose voices are being featured in the exhibits, programs, and collections, and who is actually seeing the museum's benefits. Um, and of course, as I've mentioned, what contested or stolen objects is the museum still holding on to? Um, and I found that this intervention staged by artist Divya Mera actually manages to ask these questions. Um, in 2019, she was invited to stage an intervention um, at the McKenzie Art Gallery at the University of Virginia in Canada. And while she was researching, objects in the museum's permanent collection, she discovered the colonial history behind an 18th century statue that had been looted from a temple in India, as you can see here on the left. Um, she also found that it was um, mislabeled as Vishnu. And her findings prompted the museum to repatriate the artifact back to India. Um, and so she alludes to this theft in her piece within the exhibit, um, which included a sculpture of a sack of sand placed on an altar. Um, it's titled, There's Nothing You Can Possess Which I Cannot Take Away, Not Vishnu, New Ways of Darshana. So this piece um, recalls the colonial crime scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
in which Indiana Jones attempts to steal a golden idol by swapping it out with a bag of sand equal in its weight. Um, and this initiative prompted the McKenzie Art Gallery to begin researching other objects in its collection that needed to be repatriated. And in turn, her bag of sand um, has entered the museum's permanent collection. Um, so it's kind of a, a lesson for future acquisition practices. Um, she explains, as we're having conversations about repatriation, it's a good time for institutions to acquire new works to replace items that are leaving their collections. And if you have gaps, why not commission BIPOC artists to fill them? So beyond a powerful form of truth telling, um, Mara's intervention is a call to action, which I think makes it one of the more powerful decolonial interventions um, that I've gone through so far. Um, and finally, I want to spotlight the work of a Philadelphia-based artist um, and researcher, Malkia Okek, um, who does not work within uh, the confines of an institution and does not wait for repatriation processes to play out, but instead um, reclaims cultural artifacts through digital means. Um, so using various tools to digitize and curate African materials and archives, focusing specifically on um, that of their own heritage, the Luau tribe of Kenya. Um, they digitally reconstruct these objects. Um, and they recognize that this sort of recreation is not a substitute for real repatriation, but for them, it's a way of listening to these objects. Um, they've talked about the process of digital reconstruction, um, almost like a craft, a, a meditative, process in which they can connect with their ancestors um, on a personal level and reclaim these objects as part of their own cultural heritage. So I, I urge you to check out their website. Unfortunately, I don't have the, these objects actually rotate and move around in digital space. Um, and so all of these initiatives that I've discussed here aim to challenge a system of reality that was built on prevailing assumptions and histories of colonialism and white supremacy, with some being more successful and powerful than others, um, with the most powerful being those that engage with the material legacies of colonialism. Um, and all are necessarily incomplete, um, as is the work of decolonization. Um, as museums attempt to create new forms of knowledge production, um, there also needs to be an understanding of the ongoing liveness of colonial histories. There needs to be an embrace of discomfort, of unsettling. And I'll leave you with this quote from Karen Strassler, um, who writes, rather than setting out to restore a prior wholeness, the work of repair preserves the traces of brokenness, even as it clears a path for moving forward into the future. Um, and so I know that many of you work within various art institutions or um, have art practices yourself. And so I will just leave you with that as a sort of reflection on you know, thinking about where you see spaces where repair is needed um, within the spaces in which you work and kind of what would that repair look like? How can you preserve these traces of brokenness and really kind of lean into this ongoingness of decolonization um, the necessary ambiguity and this proactive element, even as you're trying to move forward into a better future. So I'm looking forward to our discussion afterwards. Um, thank you again so much for having me and for listening. Do have some work cited. Um, if anyone is curious about, um, you know, any of these citations, or just want to get in touch with me in general, I encourage you to do so. Dr. Lee. So now we'll move into the Q and A. Um, so I can walk around to folks with the mic for all of our <coughs> attendees in person. Um, but just to get the ball rolling. Um, I was curious if you had come across any um, institutions who were doing these types of initiatives in 
many dimensions at once. And so you and I had previously talked about um, other components in addition to um, these artists and curatorial initiatives, um, such as organizational structures and how, going back to your example of the past is now, how the museum essentially reproduced harm against the guest curators um, in their attempts to, whether it be make themselves look more progressive or to address their own legacy. Um, and I was wondering if in your research, you had encountered any institutions who were working towards, um, towards these practices, but on various levels and in many dimensions. Yes, um, sorry, is there a way to change the audio? <laughs> because I can, I, it was hard to hear that question. Um, because I could hear it through my ears and okay, yes, I guess from from what I understand, the question is sort of um, perhaps where else in the museum can these initiatives take place? I think I, I gave a lot of examples about um, artist initiatives or curatorial initiatives. Um, but like where else can this practice take place? Um, is that correct? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's important to point out that sometimes, you know, it's on the burden of this kind of work falls on an education department in a museum. Um, oftentimes departments that are under resourced or sort of seen as um, marginal to the operation of the museum as a whole. And I think it's important to spotlight other places where this kind of work can take place in the museum. Um, even on a level of conservation. Um, I think there's been a lot of changes in recent years um, from those you know, practices which are very scientific, um, like a focus on how do we care for objects in the most scientific way possible um, to thinking about like, why are we doing this sort of preservation? To whom does it serve? Where can we collaborate with um, communities um, for whom these objects are very much alive um, and part of the well-being of whatever community you know you're talking about. So um, I think there are it's important to understand the history of these things like collection, storage, conservation, um, because they're each rooted in colonial ways of knowing and being and doing. Um, and so you know even with with training for things like conservation, needs to take those things into account. Um, people who are studying conservation need to understand the history of those values um, and those areas of expertise. And then also the, the collaborative element, like the social aspect of conservation. Um, so I think there's a lot of space um, for these conversations to happen, um, not just with outside artists being come in and you know, asking to do the work, um, but within the day-to-day -day operation of the museum as well. Okay, those are a lot of different questions. Um, I believe the first question was, um, can the museum go through these de decolonization processes with white staff, right? Um, well, clearly, you know, even though, as I mentioned, like diversity is not the same as decolonization, it's of course necessary for a more equitable institution um, and points to the heart of decolonization questions, which is who is telling the stories, not just what stories are being told, but whose perspectives um, are being centered and empowered. And with that, um, there definitely needs to be a reconsideration of, again, every aspect of museum governance, including hiring practices. Um, and so this is where diversity is, uh, is very key um, to including those voices. Um, so yes, <laughs> having majority of white staff is a huge, uh, block towards that goal. Um, remind me this, the second question. I know there was one about laws towards uh, repatriation laws. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there's NAGPRA in the United States, um, Native American grave um, protection laws. Um, which passed in the early 90s, I believe. Um, and this made it um, a lot easier for Native American communities to um, demand the return of um, human remains and sacred objects. Um, 
Of course, this law is confined to institutions within the United States. Um, so there have been um, limitations with tribes such as the Zuni. Um, many of their um, sacred objects are in institutions in Europe. So there are not a whole lot of legal recourse when it comes to that. Um, but NAGPRA has opened up um, opportunities for transparency. First of all, it's what I mentioned earlier with the ProPublica initiative, it's based on NACPRA. Um, and so it's kind of this initiative in which transparency is first. So it's the question is like, what is out there? And then what can be reclaimed through legal processes? Um, and of course, there's limitations on that as well. It's really focused on um, religious items and human remains. Um, and there's a biological element as well. Um, the tribe needs to have uh, like proof that a human remain has a certain amount of DNA that links, um, links it to that tribe. And so there's a lot of questions about biological determinism and race and what it means to have ownership over these items and who gets to decide that. Um, so it's, it's very messy, even though there are legal frameworks that can be used. Okay, so this um, person's coming from biological collections and asks about the role of access and benefits sharing um, in decolonizing processes, collections, right? Um, I think I could take this question from a number of different ways. It's a little bit um, ambiguous to me, but I can just kind of talk about what comes to mind um, when I hear these words. I think um, access is really important and goes back to uh, the original question on like where else in the museum can decolonization take place, um, which raises the question of, first of all, um, you know, what does stewardship look like? Um, what we often think about as stewardship is really rooted in Eurocentrism and singular ownership, but what would it look like to completely reimagine the museum as being um, a lot more accessible? So there are you know, ideas of having um, certain objects kind of traveling from place to place, um, especially in more rural areas so that you don't have everything confined to one urban center where you have to pay to get in, it's not very accessible, um, but really kind of thinking about how can we expand um, this idea of access and benefits to wider audiences. There are, you know, you can kind of get creative with this sort of thing. Um, so it's not just about bringing in community members um, for expertise, um, but also about kind of metaphorically like throwing the doors of the museum open and allowing for that access to flow outward. Um, to other communities. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if I've answered that question, um, but that those kinds of ideas are, are exciting to me. The question was, um, in other words, uh, to, to what extent is decolonization possible um, when we're only using English, um, kind of this English-centric focus? Um, and I think it's, it's extremely limited. It reflects, uh, again, like Eurocentric knowledge production. Um, in, in the book, I actually do talk about a few museums um, across the African continent um, that rely on Western forms of funding um, and how oftentimes these exhibits, um, are their labels are written only in English, which kind of is, is a red flag because it, you kind of, raises questions about who is this for? Who is the audience here? Um, and I think that kind of relates to the, the question of funding as well. Um, and so thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Absolutely, yes. The question was about um, political economy of museums, um, focusing on funding structures. Um, you gave the example of natural history museums, which are funded by people with ties to the oil industry. Um, and this is absolutely a big focus and interest of mine. Um, as you mentioned, there's a kind of a number of interrelated issues when it comes to political economy of museums. Um, you have toxic philanthropy as it's called, 
um, where someone like Warren Kanders, uh, the former vice chair of the Whitney Museum, um, was called out for his ties to the tear gas industry, um, a company called Fariland, um, whose products have been used um, against demonstrators in Gaza, against um, migrants on the border, the US-Mexico border, um, and you know, huge protest movements that came out of that, forcing him to ultimately step down. Um, but of course, the issue continues. Um, BP sponsors, at least they, they did sponsor the Tate, um, the British Museum, and it's, you know, it's, it runs really deep. Um, there's also the question of uh, nation branding and how governments um, use art institutions or fund art institutions as a way to gloss over human rights abuses um, within their own countries. Um, for example, Abu Dhabi uh, building the, the Louvre and the Guggenheim um, and kind of people bringing up questions of the uh, the migrant labor that was used to um, build these huge uh, multi-million dollar institutions. Um, and so I think it, it definitely relates to the history of colonialism and this idea of, you know, the question of what are we not seeing? You know, it could be this beautiful institution like Starkitect, you know, um, but kind of what is, what is the labor, the hidden labor, um, the hidden extraction that goes on behind the scenes to make these institutions possible and to make them run. Um, we also see this with questions around unionization. Um, recently, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, I'm, I'm coming from Philly, um, that union won its contract um, against the PMA, but it was a long struggle. And I think this kind of conversation um, around compensation and work conditions should be included um, with these larger questions on decolonization um, because it's it's still about extraction of people's time and resources. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. Ruby, okay. One of your examples highlighted how technology is used, utilized in reclamation. I've also seen digitization used in museums to create replicas of repatriated work, but a growing worry I've seen in the museum field is how Digitized models of indigenous creations can be commercialized and exploited for monetary interests. What are your thoughts about commercialization and how capital may interfere with decolonization efforts? Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, again, it's a little bit outside of my sphere of knowledge, um, but I think I'm, um, what I've seen is a lot of these um, colonize uh, these looted artifacts often show up in like smaller replicas and gift shops and things like that so there's sort of like an additional harm done when these objects are commercialized um because it's it's not just a single a singular instance of theft it's highlights this ongoing notion of theft and how the institution continues to um yeah, mo like it continues to um, take advantage of these of these works and profit from them. Um, so thank you, Ruby, for bringing that up. Um, I think you know the question of digitization is also interesting. I know that um, the British Museum recently uh, there was someone trying to digitize parts of the Parthenon marbles in order to reconstruct them and the British Museum came down really hard against this kind of thing. So in many ways, <laughs> the institution is like working against this kind of um, replication, digital replication. Um, so I kind of see it on, on both sides that there's maybe this uh, liberatory potential for these digitizing projects like Malkia Okek, for example, reclaiming their, um, their artifacts from their ancestry. But there's also this kind of double-edged sword where I can definitely see how it could be um, commercialized or how it could be used as, as a roadblock to actual repatriation. Uh, the question, what I think I would kind of put that under, again, like toxic philanthropy, where um, 
university collections in particular in this case um, kind of rely on big gifts given and oftentimes like those gifts can be traced to sort of toxic origins. Um, and I think it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it just kind of goes back to the, the problem of, of capitalism perhaps and how, you know, why are our art institutions so reliant on single individuals giving these sorts of gifts. Um, it points to the fact that um, government spending and investment in art, arts institutions has been like receding more and more, um, which points to, yeah, I mean, it kind of is just like a, a deck of cards, right? Like a um, domino effect, right? So you have institutions kind of willing to take this money um, from these, less than ethical places because they don't really have anywhere else to go necessarily. Um, so I don't have an exact answer of like what museums should do with this money. Um, it would be great to actually invest it in decolonial initiatives, um, more diverse hiring practices, um, do what uh, Divya Mera has done and kind of invite artists, um, diverse artists to create work for the institution, um, I think there are there are ways to get creative with it while also acknowledging um, where it's from. Thank you. I don't know if I can repeat um, your question, which was so beautifully framed. Um, but basically, the question was about uh, maybe the semantics or the philosophy behind decolonization and how it's seen as not uh, diversity, and yet. Um, it's completely tied up in diversity and um, who has power um, and questions of race and gender and queerness is absolutely part of that conversation. Um, I think when I said earlier, like it's not the same as diversity, um, what I meant by that is it's sort of like a yes and situation where hiring more diverse curators and staff, of course, is key to getting in those more diverse voices to challenging asymmetrical power structures, and yet it must be accompanied by other things too. It need, there needs to be an intersectional approach so that you're not just like, okay, great, we hired one diverse curator. Um, you know, the question is yes and, like how will these stories be told? Um, where are the objects from? Um, questions of pay, um, questions of, conditions of work, all of these things are wrapped up in each other to the point where it's extremely overwhelming to talk about decolonization because it is it is all encompassing and it needs to be proactive. And yes, it does need to engage with questions of diversity, absolutely. And I'm sure I'll come up with more to say um, two hours after this, but okay. <laughs> yeah, for those of you online, um, the, the statement was about um, centering inclusion um, within DEI work um, as a way of making people feel like they belong, um, which I agree is, is key. Um, and I think we need to take this, it needs to be a holistic view, I think. Um, this kind of work can't take place in one small department within the museum. It needs to pervade the entire institution. It needs to be an ongoing conversation, um, one that needs to be uncomfortable and make people feel uncomfortable often. Um, and so I don't have like a clear cut, you know, three step plan. Um, but I think it's uh, having conversations like this is, is a really good um, first step. So thank you again. <laughs>